Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm going to talk about I.O. from PRGs and NC0 at the end and bilinear maps. And in particular, I want to focus on this facet of our work, which is, um, which is a really intriguing um, insight about power of lattice-free cryptography. Okay. Um, this is joint work with Rachel Lin and Amit Sahai. Um, as you all know, uh, lattices have really revolutionized the whole space of cryptography with such uh, amazing applications. And over the past 15 years or so, uh, we have managed to find this really appealing problem of learning with error. Um, and the reason LW has been like, immensely useful is, is simply because um, it has very nice uh, worst case and which case connections. And uh, you can, you know, this problem has the promise of being as secure as several worst case lattice problems. And not only that, um, turns out it's uh, our frontier problem to build uh, post quantum crypto. And, uh, and that's because as far as we know, uh, as of today, we do not know of any uh, quantum advantage uh, for solving learning with error. And it has just really been nothing short of a great success story, starting from like inventions such as homomorphic encryption. As you know, homomorphic encryption is uh, people are trying to deploy it in industry today. It's uh, currently facing, you know, industrial push. Uh, and at the same time, recently, actually, the works on homomorphic encryption have also won Gödel Prize, which is a um, great thing for the entire field. But not only that, um, it's been useful in so many different things. And on this slide, I just listed just some of those applications, like a really a subsample. Uh, for those um, applications, attributes-based encryption, multi-key FHE, functional encryption, and uh, so many different things. So the question, the real question that we want to ask is that um, the kind of uh, hardness assumption that goes uh, in like, you know, lattice-based cryptography, are they really essential in building um, primitives such as homomorphic encryption? Can we build in, uh, it based on assumptions which have no known connections to lattices, no known reductions to and from lattices, assumptions that still may plausibly be conjectured to be secure in an unlikely, unfortunate event uh, the lattice-based hardness assumptions end up being broken. Okay. Um, and what we show is uh, a really you know, interesting uh, result. We, we show that you can build not only FHE, but like most of the applications on the previous slide, but you know, host of an other kind of applications relying on interesting uh, mix of uh, three assumptions. Um, the, I'm going to refer it as trio of assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is the decision linear assumption over symmetric bilinear maps, which is a really popular bilinear map assumption. Uh, another is like the learning parity with noise over fields with an error probability of n to the minus delta, where delta could be arbitrarily small constant greater than zero. Okay, so just barely subconstant um, amount of noise in the LPN. Okay, and you're using the field version. Um, third is existence of Boolean PRGs, which are implementable in constant depth. And they expand, say, kappa bits to barely polynomial. So kappa one to the epsilon for epsilon greater than zero, arbitrary constant greater than zero. Okay, so these three assumptions, we actually need sub-exponential security, meaning for every polynomial time attacker, the advantage or the distinguishing probability in these assumptions is just um, uh, bounded by um, some sub-exponential. Okay, so we show, you know, these three assumptions, uh, if all of them are hard, then uh, you can build FHE, but host of other primitives. Okay. So now before I proceed, you know, I want to address a couple of questions, but first I need to answer um, if I'm basing um, FHE on these kind of three assumptions, are these really incomparable uh, to lattices? I really need to at least justify you that uh, they are actually incomparable to lat uh, lattices, right? And the second is how do you even approach such a question? Okay, so let's look at the first question. And uh, of course I can, can't conclusively answer uh, this question, unless we resolve some long-standing, deep complexity questions. Uh, but we can also always reason these things uh, based on our current understanding. So um, turns out from our current understanding, and you at least look at like you know the LPN and the PRGs and NC0 assumptions, um, they aren't even known to imply something as basic as public encryption. 
Whereas on the other hand, uh, if you look at lattice-based hardness assumptions such as GAP, SVP, and um, you know LWE, they readily imply public key encryption. Okay, so this kind of indicates that um, you know uh, either we currently do not know how to build public encryption, or maybe these assumptions are not just not strong enough to give rise to public encryption. Right, and even complexity theoretically, we know that LWE sits in um, you know a structured complexity class of CoAM, uh, whereas uh, this is simply not known for the LPN and PLG CNC zero. Our current understanding is that really they are mini crypt style of assumptions. Okay, um, now when it comes to the other assumption that we are making, the decision assumption, uh, it's a number theoretic assumption. Um, and as of today, we do not know any reductions either to or from lattices. It's really an uh, interesting open question uh, if you could you know, show um, an algorithm such as LLL being applicable to solve for dealing. It'll be like really giving new insights about this problem. And uh, um, you know, it will also open up doors for, solve, for coming up with new algorithms for not only DLN, but you know, other kinds of um, assumptions out there. Okay, so these are really exciting questions in themselves, and I hope that um, you know community starts uh, focusing on these problems a little more aggressively, and hopefully we'll be able to see answers to such questions over the next uh, few years or so. Okay, um, so this reasonably answers the first question. How about, how about uh, the second one? How do I even uh, show such a result? Uh, well, one way could be that I, I um, go after every single primitive and construct them separately. That'll, of course, be counterproductive. What we do in this work is essentially we build something which not only you know, implies these, but host of other uh, primitives. Um, um, and that primitive is, of course, indistinguishability of obfuscation. Okay? Uh, so our main result is that we can build IO based on these three non-lattice problems. Uh, and I want to stress that this um, actually improves our previous result, uh, which appeared last year, where we show that you can construct IO from um, these three assumptions, additionally relying on sub-exponential hardness of learning with that. Okay. In the rest of this talk, we're going to see how this result actually works. So for the rest of this talk, let's say the circuit that you want to obfuscate is C. It, ta it takes a little n number of bits as input and outputs one bit. And throughout this talk, I'm going to denote capital N as the quantity two to the okay? Uh, so it turns out if you want to obfuscate a circuit C like this, there's actually a very intuitive obfuscation scheme, which is simply the truth table. You write down inputs from one to capital N, and then the output C of one through C of capital. Okay. And this is not going to you know, um, reveal anything about the circuit of your obfuscate, right? Other than the input output behavior. Okay. Um, however, of course, there's a very fundamental flaw with this scheme. And the flaw is that the time it takes to obfuscate this uh, is proportional to capital N. So basically, you have to run uh, the circuit C capital N times. Okay. So this doesn't qualify for uh, being a legitimate obfuscation scheme. Okay. Um, so on one hand, you have this trivial construction. Uh, on the other hand, you'd like to construct an obfuscation scheme where the time it takes should be polynomial in the side of the circuit C. Okay, and there's a huge gap right now between the two. Okay. So a natural question, which has also been asked in the cryptographic community, is that can I improve upon uh, the truth table construction a little bit? Okay. So can I construct an obfuscation scheme where the time it takes to obfuscate uh, grows like n to the 0.99, um, n to the 0 0.01 factor loss. Turns out that in beautiful prior work, it was shown that such an improvement is enough to, con to take us all the way to I O. That if I can construct such a non-trivial I O scheme, then relying on any assumption that gives rise to public key encryption, uh, and in particular dealing, you can build I O. Okay, so for our for the rest of the stock, our goal is to actually construct such an optimal At this point, I'd like to remark that our previous work actually doesn't manage to construct this. Uh, we construct an obfuscation scheme where um, the time it takes can grow with n. Um, however, the size is small. Okay? 
Um, and for such non-trivial obfuscation scheme, the only way we know how to go to IO is by additionally relying on LWE. And that's another source of um, place where we, we need to use LWE in our previous talk. Okay. However, in this talk, we'll only focus on uh, the running time of the obfuscator to be small. Okay, so now let's you know go over our approach. So what is our approach? Well, intuitively, if you think about uh, a non-trivial I/O, uh, it's just some sort of an encryption of a special input C tilde. What is C tilde? It just consists of maybe some circuit, some randomness, and something like that. But it's not. Um, and, and by the way, we want to ensure that the size uh, of C tilde is small, like n to the point nine nine, and the running time of this encryption is also small. Uh, but it's not just any encryption. It's an encryption which hides everything about the circuit C, except magically lets you learn functions uh, of the form ux of C tilde equals to C of x for every input x in capital N. Okay, so it lets you learn the truth table, but nothing else. In other words, if you could construct such an encryption scheme where you can learn uh, the truth table and nothing else, the size of this encryption or the running time is small, then you would be done. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we are not quite there yet. Uh, and the reason is that we haven't really simplified anything. Um, as such, this circuit ux of c tilde equals to c of x is quite complex in that it runs the circuit c itself on x. So we haven't really achieved anything. And current techniques don't let us construct such encryption schemes. Okay. So reasonable question to ask here, uh, can I replace these ux of c tilde it's something um, relatively much more simpler. Um, the answer to the question is yes. Classical works have shown that if you use PRGs in NC0 assumption that they are using, uh, then you can effectively replace this with much simpler functions. How simple? So let's say the locality of the PRG that you use is D. So what is locality? Uh, locality is a number. So in PRGs in NC0, every output bit actually can depend only on a constant number of input bits. And that number, uh, that constant is locality. So um, what we're shown is that if PRGs with locality D exists, then uh, you can replace UX of C tilde with specifically chosen 3D plus one local functions, okay? Um, so every output bit just depends on 3D plus one bits. Therefore, it's a 3D plus one degree polynomial, okay? The minimum value of D that you could choose um, in, in literature for, uh, for such PRGs is five. Therefore, it turns out that the minimum degree that you can use is 16, okay? So as a consequence of all this, um, you can come up with an encryption scheme uh, which hides everything about the circuit except magically lets you learn specifically chosen, specifically designed degree 16 functions once that are given to you, to you by this uh, theorem, right? And the point of these functions is that these functions hide everything about the circuit, except they only let you learn the truth table and nothing else. That's the security property. Okay, so now if I can construct such an encryption scheme, which allows me to compute um, where I encrypt C tilde and lets you learn degree 16 functions like this, I'll be done. So the question is, what is known for such an encryption scheme? So it turns out um, we're not quite there yet. And that, hypothetically speaking, if these were not degree 16, these were degree two polynomials, okay? They're not degree two, but assume that they were degree two polynomials over some time field. Then uh, actually there is uh, quadratic functional encryption, which have been studied for quite some time, uh, which you can base on DLM, um, and you'd be done, right? However, the problem is that, uh, these functions, they are not degree two, they are actually degree 16 as they are saying. So what do we do in this work? We come up with a way to pre-process C tilde, right? Such that uh, pre-processing is efficient to do. And at the same time, uh, you know, the degree reduces to two. Then okay? UX of C tilde can be computed by degree two polynomial over C tilde. Okay, uh, so that's what we, I'm going to talk about. Uh, but note that they should already ring a bell. You shouldn't really expect that, you know, take arbitrary computation of degree 16. And um, you shouldn't really expect that you should be able to pre-process such that 
the fee processing is simultaneously short and then at the same time, the re degree reduces to two. We shouldn't really expect that. In fact, that's not what we exactly do. Uh, we work uh, a different kind of pre-processing model. So we allow for a public input, okay? So we're gonna take CTOLA, pre-process this in, uh, into two components, a public component, which of course, public component is gonna hide uh, CTOLA. It has to, because it's public. Um, then um, you're gonna also have a secret component. We're gonna only encrypt the secret component. And now this polynomial is allowed to be constant degree polynomial over the public component, but only degree two in the public. Okay. Luckily for us, uh, using bilinear maps, you can also build encryption schemes supporting these uh, computations, which have a public component and you evaluate constant degree on, on the public and degree two in the secret. Okay. And these schemes uh, go by the name of partially hiding functional encryption, which is actually also built uh, specifically for the context of IO in, in the line of work that I mentioned in this slide. Okay, uh, for the rest of this talk, we'll ignore the public component and just focus on you know, degree reduction, um, like kind, kind of intuitively suggesting how you can reduce the degree to two. Okay, uh, the public component will implicitly talk. Okay, so um, how do we do it? This is where we're gonna use our key assumption, which is the learning parity noise. Um, and re remember the goal is to reflect, replace this computation UX of C tilde by quadratic functions. Uh, we do it in two steps roughly. In the first step, we solve this problem approximately. So we know almost solve this problem, okay? So how do we do that? Uh, we're going to take this C tilde, pre-process it into another short input S, okay? Um, such that for most inputs X, it will now happen that FX of S is equal to UX of C tilde. Already, it's kind of already solved the problem almost. Okay, now once we have that, uh, what we do, um, and this is where, where, by the way, we can use LPN, but once we have that, uh, we can come up with another polynomial in another short input M. And this polynomial is also degree two, such that when I add it to what I already computed, it somehow starts giving correct output on every. Okay, and this is where we're going to use a surprisingly simple idea of matrix factorization. Okay. So we're going to uh, see the first part first. Um, we're going to goal is to come up with, um, you know, this um, a degree two polynomial which approximately solves the problem. Okay. And this is where actually we're going to use uh, the most intuitive idea that you can think of, which is to, you know, use LPN to uh, encrypt C tilde. So remember we wanted to compute degree 16 polynomials on C tilde. What we do is simply uh, encrypt it using LPN. So re recall what LPN says, AS plus E, where E is a sparse error, appears pseudo random. So what we're going to do, we're going to sample our coefficient matrix A, multiply it with a short dimension secret S, then you're going to add sparse noise chosen over Z key, um, and then, we're going to add C tilde. We're going to write it as a vector and then we're going to add C tilde. Uh, and this way we have formed a vector B, um, which is by adding all of them, mod P. Okay. Now, what's the point of all of doing all this? The point is now A and B actually together they encrypt C tilde, they hide C tilde, and that is because of the LPN assumption, because AS plus E is pseudo random. Okay. The point is it's actually encoded with a secret which is of very small dimension as compared to the length of C tilde. And this is what makes it uh, helpful for the degree compression step. Okay, so let's see how. Uh, so we have this equation on the right. Um, remember, our goal is to find a degree two function in another short input S, such that for most input X, Fx of S is equal to Ux of C tilde. So I'm going to just give you the candidate and then I'm going to argue both properties. The candidate is simply ux of b minus as, which is a degree 16 polynomial in the secret and b and a, okay? Um, so let's observe the second property first. The point is b minus as is nothing but c tilde plus l, right? 
And now remember, UX was a 16 local function only depended on 16 bits of C tilde. Uh, and error was actually sparse. It's very sparse. So for most of the inputs X, UX of C tilde plus error is exactly going to be UX of C tilde. Okay, just because the error is very sparse. So this answers the second question. Now you want to understand why um, is it okay to do? Why is it degree two in S and a constant degree in the public component B and A? Well, the idea behind us is that it's a degree 16 polynomial, so it, it's degree in B is 16, it's degree in A is also 16, and it's degree in S is also 16. We don't care about its degree in B and A because constant degrees are fine. Um, in S, it's degree 16. However, note that S is very small in dimension. Therefore, I can trivially quadratize it. So when I interpret it in another variable, capital S, okay, which consists of um, all monomials in small s uh, of degree at most eight, and that variable, it's actually degree two. Okay, um, and as a consequence of this, um, um, we're good because if S is very small, capital S is going to be small. Just to give you a sense, if dimension of S is like n to the point one, capital S is going to be at most n to the point eight. Okay, and this kind of completes the argument why we managed uh, to find polynomial which ex um, approximately computes it on every input x. So now how do we fix the problem? Um, how do we do the second step? That's really intuitive as well. So remember uh, what we want to do. We want to compute this function, right? And what we have managed to do, we have managed to do this function. And if I can com uh, come up with a polynomial which uh, computes the difference of these two, then I'll be good, okay? So observe that this is going to be like, you know, a sparse vector because fx already approximate on most of the inputs. And the point is that if I look at this function, it's very sparse. So I can effectively arrange it as a matrix and then kind of factorize that matrix. So the matrix is going to be sparse. Uh, it's going to be like low rank and low rank matrices can be factored, okay? And you will get a compressed uh, M, okay? So as a consequence of this, uh, you can come up with a degree two function which computes the difference and then you can add it and that way you will get the, the correct output. Okay, so this really completes uh, both the, like roughly, and of course I'm hiding a lot of details from the run. just wanted to give you the key intuition. So however, there's a problem with it in the argument that I showed, the time it takes to pre-process this public and secret part is actually going to be capital N because remember we, we are computing the difference and then compressing it, the time it takes to do that is going over every input capital N, right? So the time it's, it's going to take is capital N. So this doesn't solve the problem. Um, and this additionally requires LWE if you want to make this idea work. The key inside of this paper is that if I wanted to do this computation for many, many circuits, let's say K circuits, it turns out that we can actually amortize in K. So we can come up with the way to preprocess such that the time it takes is like, um, n times k to the one minus epsilon for some epsilon plus polynomial in k, okay? And turns out that this saving in k is enough to get us all the way to i1. And that's one of the main contributions for this paper. Now, of course, uh, I'm not going to lo in a lot of details for this. Um, the key argument is really combinatorial and it relies on uh, exact circuit implementation for you know specific RAM programs such as lookups and sorting, uh, sorting networks and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go that uh, go over that in this talk. Okay, um, and with that, you know, I'd like to thank you for listening in, um, and I would lead, like to leave you at uh, some open questions, uh, interesting open questions. So one of the most interesting qu open questions is, can I construct FHE uh, from these assumptions, like non-lattice assumptions, but in a direct man manner? Right now, I'm going through I/O, and it's really you know, just a feasibility result. And the question is, can Balina maps and like these assumptions somehow be leveraged to give rise to FHE directly. Um, and then the same question in which I also kind of threw out the talk I mentioned is just beautiful complexity theoretic questions that came along connecting lattice-based problems with uh, other kinds of problems that exist out there. With that, I'd like to thank you. <laughs>